Celine and Julie vont en bateau throws together two different women, a pent-up librarian named Julie and a sexy bohemian stage magician named Celine. Each sees something in the other that calls to them. What starts as an art film version of Laverne and Shirley turns into a mystical mystery about owning multiple selves. Jacques Rivette had a real weakness for referencing literature in his films. Céline et Jolie, Vont en Bateau, is chock full of literature, particularly Lewis Carroll and Henry James. Julie, like Alice, is dozing off over a book when a panicked white rabbit, Céline, rushes past on her way to a mysterious important date. She's in too much of a hurry to pick up her sunglasses, her scarf, and old baby doll, and thus the adventure begins, Céline leading Julie out of her staid life into a surreal underground world. Like Alice and Baptiste in Pont du Nord, Julie chases Céline around Paris until their cosmic connection becomes unavoidable. In Julie's library, they wordlessly and simultaneously trace their handprints and fingerprints in red. The two move in together, hijinks ensue. They're complete opposites, but they seem bent on trying on each other's skins. Julie gleefully, unconvincingly disguises herself in Céline's sunglasses and scarf. Céline poses as Julie to meet Julie's childhood sweetheart. Et nous Extase, sodomisation perverse et mystique, spleen homosexuel dans le grenier, déguisé en alsacienne. She jilts him, possibly an act of jealousy, but maybe just a friend trying to steer her friend towards the light. Julie poses as Celine for an audition, and that goes horribly, but somehow it excites her potential backers. Céline tells Julie about this weird abusive family she works for as a nanny, two sisters vying for the love of a widower and his sickly little girl. You may recognize one of the sisters, played by Bulle Augier, in Rivette's later Le Pont du Nord. She thinks they're chasing her down because she uncovered their family secrets. When the two women approach the family's mansion, though, it looks deserted. Weirder, when either of them go inside, they black out and emerge hours later with no idea what's happened, reeling as if drugged. The pair discover that, if they suck on a magical lozenge, they can remember the events inside the house. Maybe another Lewis Carroll reference, eat me, drink me. But maybe a hint at Marcel Proust's Petite Madeleine cookie, which brings his childhood back in remembrance of things past. Armed with this magic candy, they explore the mansion time and again, finding that each day repeats itself, Groundhog Day style. As the movie dives deeper and deeper into the murder house, the most fun thing to watch becomes Celine and Julie themselves. Their reactions to the gothic soap opera unfolding are hilarious, and they reflect us as the viewers shouting at the screen. <laughs> But in Celine and Julie's case, what they're watching may very well have life or death consequences. Disturbingly, at the end of each day, the little girl is murdered, which seems not to bother the rest of the family. Another literary reference to Henry James' least beloved novel, The Other House. In James's story, a web of people have reasons to want a little girl dead, as she stands between them and their passions. So when the widower's lover takes the girl for a walk and she conveniently dies, nobody says anything. Rivette doesn't go into that much detail, leaving it all like a never-ending daytime soap opera, which is also how it's acted. Perhaps the best, if not the most learned, comment on the film comes from Ty Burr at Entertainment Weekly. It's as if Borges had cast Thelma and Louise in Groundhog Day. Like Bill Murray in that classic comedy, Celine and Julie memorize the events in the house until they can navigate its story however they wish. Eventually, they scheme to save the little girl's life and escape from her vicious cycle. Saved from this shadow dimension, the little girl moves in with Celine and Julie. The ending of the film recalls the preface poem for Alice Through the Looking Glass. A tale begun in other days when summer suns were glowing. A simple rhyme that served to time the rhythm of our rowing. The famous children's book was inspired by Carol rowing on an idyllic day with young Alice Little. But as Celine, Julie, and the child enjoy a day on the river, another boat drifts past. But this was all a dream. Celine awakens, having nodded off reading her book of magic spells, and sees Julie racing past. They have switched places and seem ready to relive the story again. This time Julie hunts Celine, next time Celine hunts Julie. Despite all the outdoor scenes in Parisian parks, the house is the center of gravity. It pulls the action always towards its claustrophobic chambers. Almost American, I have to watch him. The 1985 hit, Desperately Seeking Susan, owes an obvious debt to Selena Julie with its dangerous, personality-swapping antics. But I'd say the nearest American equivalent is David Lynch's Mulholland Drive, where an awkward woman, obsessed by a ravishing, dark-haired beauty who suffers from memory loss, creates a fantasy mystery with a literal mystery box, and relives gothic events which may or may not have ever happened. There's even, as in Selena Julie, an audition that goes considerably better than one would ever expect. And, just like in Céline et Julie and Le Pont du Nord, the mismatched women become amateur sleuths to solve a surreal, supernatural mystery. 
Mulholland Drive is admittedly a lot darker than Celine et Julie, and replaces magic with mental illness. But the two films seem separated at birth, just like Celine and Julie.